Thank you, David. Good morning. It's good to be with you all today. Appreciate the opportunity for us to gather together. By way of introduction, is there any way to get this up higher or am I stuck here? Just brute force, yep. got it, thank you. By way of introduction to today's topic, I wanna to tell you a story. Let me take you back into ancient Israel's history, more specifically to the Southern Kingdom of Judah, to a time when a man named Joash was king. I want you to remember that name, Joash, because he's the one we're gonna focus on. Joash was only a child when he became king. He was just seven years old. And a big part of the reason why he was so young takes us even further back into Israel's history, Judah's history. Judah had been evil. They had walked away from the Lord. They had taken on the idols of the nations around them. And a major part of their apostasy came because they allied themselves with the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, the northern kingdom at that time was ruled by one of Israel's worst kings, King Ahab. And to get a little sense of how bad Ahab was, whenever the author of the book of Kings wants to tell you that a king was good, he'll tell you that that king walked in the ways of his father, David. Whenever the author wants to tell you that a king was bad, initially he starts out telling you that that king walked in the ways of Jeroboam. Jeroboam's the first king that led the northern kingdom into apostasy. He's the measuring stick of evil kings until Ahab comes along. Ahab is right up there with him. He gets included at times so that the author will tell you that when a king leads the people away from God, that he walked in the ways of Ahab, or he'll compare him to Ahab. Ahab was especially wicked. Ahab had a daughter. Her name was Athaliah. She married a prince of Judah, a man who later became king of the southern kingdom. Together they had a son, Amaziah. I know it's a lot of names to keep straight. Where are we at this point? What should you be keeping in mind? The two nations are now allied through marriage. The king of Judah married a daughter of Ahab. He married into a royal family that was responsible for rejecting God on multiple different levels. A man who was responsible for leading an entire nation to reject God in favor of other gods. But then as God does, what does he do? He stepped in. He decided that he was going to wipe out Ahab's entire family. And so he sent a prophet, a young man named Jehu, to sent a prophet, I'm sorry, to a young man named Jehu to be the next northern king. Prophet gave Jehu specific instructions to eradicate Ahab's family, this family of leaders who had compromised, who had added other gods into Israel's worship, and had led God's people both in the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom to trust in something else other than God. Jehu proceeded to destroy Ahab's family, including the king of Judah. The king of Judah at that time was visiting the northern kingdom. But Jehu did not kill Ahab's daughter, Athaliah. She was still alive. She's down in the southern kingdom in Judah. She'd been married to the previous king. They had a son who became king. That king was killed by Jehu. And Athaliah says, wow, this is my opportunity. I'm going to pick up the story from 2 Kings chapter 11, beginning verse 1. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she proceeded to destroy the whole royal family. But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Jehoram and sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, and Joash, remember, is the guy that we're focusing on, took Joash, son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from the royal princes who were about to be murdered. She put him and his nurse in a bedroom to hide him from Athaliah so he was not killed. He remained hidden with his nurse at the temple of the Lord for six years while Athaliah ruled the land. So Athaliah seized power. She usurped the throne by killing off any other royal contenders, including some who may have been her own grandchildren. Joash was her own grandson. Tried, she actively tried to kill him. But Joash the legitimate heir to the throne is saved. And he's saved by this lady, Jehoshaphat. Now, you go into Second Chronicles and you learn that she's actually the wife of the priest. She's the wife of a man named Jehoiada. And Jehoiada keeps Joash hidden until he's seven years old. He then brings Joash out into public under heavy guard and installs him as king over Judah. Athaliah finds this out. She screams that this is treason and they kill her. 
Joash then rules the southern kingdom for many years. And he does really well. He's considered one of the good kings in the first part of his reign. And the reason that he does well, 2 Kings chapter 12, verse 2, is that Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years Jehoiada the priest instructed him. I think, okay, well, what does it mean that he did right? We're given a very long count of how he restored the temple. That's the place where God met personally with his people. But the temple over the years had fallen into disrepair. In fact, the members of the royal family at one time had even broken into it, grabbed the sacred objects out of it to go serve the Baals, the idols. Joash restored the temple, oversaw the temple's restoration. He re-outfitted it with all the necessary tools, the implements in order to offer the sacrifices that God prescribed. And so Joash essentially restored worship of God to the southern kingdom. He restored a commitment to God right at the center of the people where God should be. Afterward, we learn 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 15, that Jehoiada dies. Now, Jehoiada was old and full of years, and he died at the age of 130. He was buried with the kings in the city of David because of the good he had done in Israel for God and his temple. It's pretty good when you get buried with the kings. But now we come to a turning point in the story. After the death of Jehoiada, the officials of Judah came and paid homage to the king, and he listened to them. They abandoned the temple of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and worshiped Asherah poles and idols. Now, if you're listening closely, what you just heard was a really big silence. Scripture often does this, right? The officials came and paid homage to the king, and he listened to them, period. Moving on, next sentence, no commentary. They abandoned the temple of the Lord. He listened to them. They abandoned the temple. And you're left there realizing, wow, they, they said something to him that did what? That swayed him, that moved him. They said something that appealed to him, something that he paid attention to, something that made sense to him and made so much sense that he abandoned the temple. He abandoned the restoration work. He abandoned the Lord. And he chose instead to worship Asherah. She's a fertility goddess and various other idols instead. Now, this is not okay with God. When his people leave him, it's never okay with God. And so he sent a prophet to speak out in order to call the people back. This man stood before the people, verse 20, and said, this is what God says. Why do you disobey the Lord's commands? You will not prosper because you've forsaken the Lord. He has forsaken you. But the people didn't listen. They plotted against him, and by order of the king, they stoned him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. It's a tragic story. It's actually worse than it sounds on the front end, because this prophet was the son of Jehoiada, the priest who had rescued this boy from death, who had brought him into his home, who had nurtured him, who set him on his throne, who had then counseled him. Joash went from bad, I'm sorry, from good to bad, from godly to wicked, and he ends his life in a disgrace. His own officials assassinate him because he ordered the death of the priest's son. He went from rescued to ruined, and the turning point is what in the story? The turning point is he listened. He listened to people who led him to adopt Asherah and the idols, people who had something along these lines to say to him. You know, King, Yahweh, Israel's God, Yahweh's all right. He's good for religious festivals and all that, helps the people with morality. He's all right as far as he goes, but we're not keeping up. We're not keeping up with the modern world. Don't you think that there are other thoughts out there, other ideas out there that we should consider, other values that we should embrace? Maybe some other gods that would help us to make sense out of this world, who would help us in ways that Yahweh can't. I would suggest that they spoke with a voice that is present in every age for every believer, a voice that Joash found very tempting. 
a voice that he fell for, a voice that says God and his ways are nice, but they're not really enough. You need something else. You need something other than him to handle the day-to-day -day challenges of life. You need other gods. You need what? other authorities, other sources of knowledge, other values, other approaches to life, something that will substitute functionally as the center of gravity for what we think and in order to navigate life. Now, in Joash's case, it was the more modern option that appealed to him, what the nations all around were into. But that's not the only danger that believers are offered. This voice that says God is not enough, not adequate for the problems of living, that voice can tempt you in other directions as well. Let me take you to another scripture. I told you I was going to do this this morning. Let me take you to another scripture. You remember Joshua, Moses' right-hand man. God used him to bring his people into the land after they'd been wandering in the wilderness. At the end of his life and ministry, Joshua urges the people to dedicate themselves to the God who has rescued them, to the God who has cared for them and given them a new home. And he says this to them in chapter 24 of the book of Joshua, verse 14, addressing Israel. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And as you listen there, you realize he just gave them a couple different options. Options that will offer themselves as God's substitutes. Joshua says, if you don't want to serve God, you have a couple choices that are open to you. Option one, you can serve the gods of your ancestors. So if you have a more traditional bent, if you're a little more conservative, if you think that the good old days were the best, then there are gods for you. Look backwards, serve the gods of your ancestors. Or, option two, you can serve the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. If you are of a more modern bent, a little more progressive, if you're inclined to see the past as the bad old days, then the way forward is what? It's forward. That only the gods of the modern world are up to handling the problems of the modern world. And so then choose the gods of the land that you are living in. Here's the point, whether you're more traditional or more progressive, there are always alternatives in this world that will be offered to you, that will vie for your attention, that will vie for your allegiance. And it can be really subtle, right? It's how it tends to be in the secular West. It's not a complete disregard for God. It's a, an also, it's an additive. Something that says, of course you can keep your religion. That's good makes you a better person. But here's all these other ideas and ways of life that you have to embrace if you want to live in the modern world. The danger, however, is written throughout the history of Israel's kings. That whenever you add anything to God, what you're really saying is that he alone is not enough. That what he says is not enough. That it's not fully up to dealing with all the areas of life. The faith in him is nice. It's a good thing. But if you really want to live well, you have to rely on something else. And so what does that do for us in the church? It tends to push God into a corner. And we relegate him to what we call spiritual areas of life. He's, he's, he's the way that we're going to get to heaven. Or we relegate him to certain activities. That's what we go to church for. But on Tuesday morning, on Thursday evening, there is something else that functionally drives us. A different authority, a different God. And that's my fear for the modern church in the West. And please hear this. I don't think the danger is from one direction inside the church only. I know that many in the church, and we're talking now capital C church, many in the church will talk like that. The more progressive wing of the church will look at the conservatives and say, you are the problem. And the conservatives do what? They look at the more progressive wing and say, no, you are the problem. That's really easy to do, right? To, to polarize 
people and to, to say that that bifurcation is, is, is valid and one of those sides is right and one side is wrong. The problem is bigger than that. I've long prided myself on not being an alarmist, on not giving in to people who start talking about how our society is unusually bad or it's terribly immoral. And so I've said things for years like, the world that you and I live in is not even close to what the church had to face in the Greco-Roman world. If you want immorality, they, they outstripped modern American culture. Or it's not even close to what our brothers and sisters have faced and continue to face under communist regimes. We are not yet so decadent or so persecuted. And so if the church can thrive in those areas, well, surely it can thrive here too. That's what I've said. Apparently I've changed over the past year. My daughter noticed this. We went out to visit her and she pointed this out. And she asked me a couple of months ago, what are you seeing differently? Because you're talking differently. Really helpful observation for me. I think she's right. I think there is something that has changed. And I laid out a couple of things that I see in the larger world. But it's one of those questions that sort of, you know, digs itself into your brain and you keep thinking about it. You think, what? That, that was a good mirror for me. I'm different. Now, why? I think the biggest reason, as I have thought about this over the last several months, is not simply because of things taking place in the larger world. There are things in the larger world that I am very concerned about. But the world is what the world's always been, Right? It just takes different forms. But the world always creates an environment that works very hard to do away with scripture. That's just part of what it's like to live in this world. We should expect that. My real issue, therefore, is not with the world. The world is what the world is. My bigger issue is with the church. And again, I'm thinking capital C church. And I'm thinking specifically with what I've seen uh, and how I've seen us respond in the US to what's been taking place over this last year. How much of our approach seems to rest on the same stuff that the larger world rests on and relies on. How we use the same categories of thought to dissect our world. How we have the same responses and how we promote the same responses that the world has. Let's just take one illustration this morning and talk about how we've engaged politics over this last year. And I don't mean let's have a discussion about the easy polar categories of Christian nationalism on one side versus what people refer to as the woke church on the other. Those categories are there. They're, they're, they're not actually what concern me, however, because I think the bigger issue is more sinister. It's deeper than those obvious polarities those polarities which mirror our American society's polarities, I think the bigger concern is that both sides share a common vision. Each end imagines an earthly utopia. They're different utopias, I really get that. But they each imagine a utopia, a vision of what the world really can be. And that given the right circumstances and the right resources, they both believe that they can usher in that vision that they have. They both believe that the means to doing so is a reliance on human institutions. Let me call them out on education, on legislation, and on political vehicles of various stripes. They each believe that there is a human means at hand that is capable of ushering in the world of righteousness and peace that they envision. It's the belief, you say it a little bit different, it's the belief on both sides that if we just have the right positions, if we convince enough people that those positions are right so that the majority of people vote the right way, if we can just do that, then what? Then we can eliminate issues of immorality, issues of inequality, and we can generate and create a just society. And my concern is that that belief is the same on both sides of the culture war regardless of what you mean by immorality, inequality, and justice. Both sides have their own definitions, but they trust the same things to accomplish their agenda. It's the belief that we can educate and legislate our way to a good world, that give us enough time, 
Give us enough ideas, give us enough learning, enough training, let us learn from enough mistakes, and we can craft a society that will be better, that will be just, that will eliminate immorality and inequality. Here's one of the ways that you can tell that this is entrenched in us in the church. It's that when you say things like, man, we are way too optimistic about the goodness of humanity, or things like we can't bring the kingdom of God through legislation and social reform. When you say stuff like that, then people in the church, not outside the church, when you say stuff like that, people hear you saying, oh, we can't do anything. Why even bother? In other words, when you say something about this poll, they immediately run to this poll and say, well, this is what you're advocating. It's not what I'm saying. You didn't hear me say that. I don't believe that there is nothing that we can do. What I'm saying is that you cannot make the law do what only grace can do. That's a really important piece for us in the church. You cannot make the law do what only grace can do. What can the law do? What can legislation do? What can education do? Those things are important. They restrain sin. They restrain evil. They can make it harder to hurt someone. That is something that we can do. That's something that we must do in society. But limiting evil and its effects is vastly different from transforming a society. Or maybe more accurately say it, transforming the people within a society. There's a goodness to restraining sin and evil. But restraining sin and evil is not the same as turning haters into lovers. It's not the same as turning misers into generous philanthropists. It's not the same as turning hypocrites into models of integrity. It's not the same as turning selfishness into sacrifice. So yes, by all means, make it harder to sin against your neighbor, but don't expect that to turn sinners into saints, regardless of which utopian vision you have. You cannot produce it through external means. You can't produce it through education, legislation, political activism. And yet, as I look at the church over this last year on both sides, it seems to me that we believe we can. And we act as though that was possible. And we are willing to go to war with anyone who disagrees, including anyone in the church. What is that? I mean, that, that is effectively the church looking around at our neighbors and at what they worship. And we've thought to ourselves, you know what? That looks like that could work. That, that's something that we could actually add to God and it would not subtract from God and it would not ruin our worship of God. That would be compatible with him. And so my suggestion is that we have welcomed the modern gods of education and politics and activism into the temple. The concern that I have that my daughter picked up on is not that the world is so bad. My concern is that I don't see the church responding in a robust Christian way to the world. And I've even debated saying that <laughs> because as soon as I say it, here's my fear. My fear is that immediately uh, there's gonna be something in our hearts that stirs up and says, yes, that's absolutely right. What do we really need? We really need churches that are big that are influential across a very wide region, that are led by dynamic, charismatic, visionary leaders that generate three and four different programs that go out and really impact and influence the larger society, that are respected by the world around us, that are something we ourselves can be proud of. Now, what did I just lay out? I just laid out all of the American pragmatic stuff that drives how we think about corporations and we think about respect and we think about success. From the, we, we struggle is what I'm trying to say. We struggle to even think about and assess the problem from a Christian viewpoint. We act like the world, we rely on the same things the world does and we think in the categories that the world hands us. Is it any wonder then that we would promote the solutions of the world? All right, what's the obvious solution then? The obvious solution is to go back to God, to relearn who he is 
how he feels, how he thinks, what he thinks about, the kinds of resources that he offers to us, what he calls us to do, because he does call us to something that does impact the larger world. Which means then the solution is to go back to the word of God, to learn from him, back to how God sees life and back to how God calls us to live. It's the obvious solution that we already think we know. And that's the challenge for you and me this morning. It's the solution that you and I think that we've already given ourselves to, that we already believe in. It's the solution that most of the church that has responded so badly this past year thinks that it believes in. It's one that we at Renewal believe in. And so it'd be really easy this morning to walk away, patting ourselves on the back and saying, you know, we got this. Yeah, the world is bad. The rest of the church is not all that different, but, but we're okay because we're already on board with how important scripture is. That's my fear for this morning, that we'll walk out of here feeling self-satisfied and very confident that we're on the right page and that really there's nothing in our lives that needs to change. You know me enough by now. Let me see if I can shake up that confidence a little bit. And the way that I want to do that is by what has shaken my confidence, that I've got this. I want us to consider several moments from Jesus's life. It's always helpful, right? When you think you got this, go back to Jesus and see what he's doing. You go, oh man, yeah, I got a long way to go. Because when we consider Jesus, these moments I think will show us how really far you and I are from relying on scripture, which really, I, that's what we should all expect, right? We can't say that the church in the US is in bad shape without realizing wait, renewal is part of the church in the U.S. And therefore, the issues in the larger church are going to be what we find in here. And then if you extend the logic just a little bit further, you realize, wait, I, I'm part of renewal. And so I should expect to see the same weaknesses and the same failings in the larger church in myself. The same reactions, the same reliance, the same lack of using biblical categories that are so easy to spot everywhere else have to also be true of me, which becomes super clear as I look at Jesus. So here's just a couple of accounts from his life. First, we're familiar with the account of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness in Matthew 4. I'm not going to read that this morning. Let me summarize. The devil comes and tempts Jesus three different times. He offers three different things that Jesus very much wanted in that moment. He offers him a way to eat. Very important since Jesus has been fasting for 40 days. He offers Jesus a way to display his glory so that everybody sees it. This amazing, infinite, glorious son of God who's been shrouded for 30 years. Nobody gets him. Here's a way for everybody to see. He gives Jesus a way where he can have the rule over all the kingdoms of this earth. That's essentially a shortcut to the cross. It's a way for him to avoid all the pain and suffering that was coming and still be the king of the world. Three different temptations, each extremely meaningful in that moment. Real temptations. And Jesus responds to Satan each time, and you know how he does this. He responds each time by saying, it is written. And then he quotes scripture. Three times, it is written, it is written, it is written. And you think about that. You've been starving for days. <laughs> no one really gets you. You could skip the unimaginable suffering that's in front of you, temptations that you can feel. And what is it that comes first to Jesus's mind is scripture. In the pressure and the squeezing of that moment, what is squeezed out is what he relies on. The way that he processes temptation, the resource that he thinks he has is what? It's scripture. You look at that and then you ask yourself, is that what comes out of you when you're tempted? Is it the first thing on the top of your mind, the resource that you turn to, you feel pressured, you feel squeezed? Does scripture come out in that moment? Does in Jesus? Fast forward into the Garden of Gethsemane. It's right after his last meal, the Passover with his disciples. Jesus has been talking with them. He's been teaching them. He's been comforting them. He's been trying to get them ready for him to leave them. They've gone out of the upper room, out to Gethsemane, and he tells them, he's opening his heart to them. He says, I'm overwhelmed 
with sorrow to the point of death. This is going to kill me. He prays with such agony that he's sweating, maybe even bleeding. He's asking his father, is there some possible way to avoid what's coming in front of me? He's doing all of that while, while his friends fell asleep. Here comes an armed mob. They're come to arrest him. One of his closest friends on earth steps up to him to betray him. He does it with a kiss, uses this intimate moment to destroy him. Then chaos breaks out. The men step forward to arrest him. Peter takes out his sword, swings it, cuts off the high priest's servant's ear. And what is uppermost in Jesus's mind at that moment? Anger, self-pity, paralysis. He's overcome, overwhelmed by the events, anguish at what he's facing, trying to figure a way out, wondering, is there some way, some kind of deal I can cut? No, none of that. Verse 52, he says, put your sword back in its place. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. Listen, but how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? He says, I could stop this anytime I wanted to. But there's something that I want a whole lot more and that is that scripture is fulfilled. I not only know God's word, he says, but I am 110% committed to living it out. What is uppermost in his mind is the scriptures. It's what they say. It's how they apply to this moment. It's what he needs to do in order to comply with them to bring his life and his desires in line with the word of God. And that comes out of him at a moment of just sheer madness. That doesn't happen unless it is thoroughly inside of you. Let's go a little while later. Hours and hours after he'd been arrested, paraded back and forth between Pilate and Herod, whipped and beaten to within an inch of his life. He's forced to drag his cross through the streets of Jerusalem on the way to his execution. And he's followed. Luke 23, verse 27. Followed by a large number of people, including women, who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, for the time will come when you will say, blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. And then he quotes scripture. He says, they will say that, then they will say to the mountains, fall on us into the hills, cover us. It's a quote from the prophet Isaiah and from Hosea. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? Again, put yourself in that moment. What is going through his mind in that chaos? Surrounded by a crowd, his life literally dripping out of him. Women following him, wailing, weeping. And he runs all of that experience through a biblical grid. He uses scripture to interpret that horrible moment. And then he takes that scripture and he offers it back to others to help them figure out how they should experience that moment as well, how to help them process it. You don't do that unless it's that deeply inside of you. One last one, John 19 on the cross. After nearly six hours, hours of intense, unremitting physical anguish, even worse, hours experiencing the father forsaking him. He's experiencing the white hot heat of being abandoned by God, cut off from his own father, cut off from the source of every good thing that you and I have ever known, abandoned by God, and yet he refuses himself to abandon God. We read that right before his death, verse 28, that later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. Why did he say, I'm thirsty? So that scripture would be fulfilled. Catch that. Jesus, to rescue you and me, experienced hell for you and me. Agonies that are impossible for us to ever fully understand. We will not get that at the end of eternity. And in the middle of that agony, what is it that's concerning him? What's on his mind? How much longer do I have to do this? Gee, I hope this really works. 
No. What's on his mind in that moment is what else do I need to do so that scripture, so that the word of God would be fulfilled? Brothers and sisters, when you are pushed to the edge of yourself physically, emotionally, spiritually, when you are pushed to the edge of yourself and then pushed beyond, what comes out of you at that moment is what's most essential about you. You don't have the ability, the strength to filter it at that moment. You have the ability to think it through. You're just what? You're just responding. You're responding with what you really trust in, with what you really anchor your life in. And in those moments, what comes out of Jesus, it's scripture. It flows out of him as freely as his blood flowed out of him. It has such a place in his life, it's always on his mind. It informs how he thinks about all of life. It's the resource that he goes to when he's tempted. Fulfilling it is his greatest desire. You and I have to ask the question, is that what comes out of us in those extreme moments when we're pushed, when you're tempted? The scripture, the pair of glasses that you have, that you use to see all the rest of life. I have such a long road to go on before that's true of me. But I want to be on that road. And my longing in my heart for renewal is that we are on that road. Here's my plea to us as a church, and especially to us then as leaders. Dig into scripture. The world is changing. We do not have robust responses to it. Dig into scripture like you've never dug into it before. Dig into it until you know it backwards and forwards, until it just starts to seep out of your pores like it did out of Christ's. Know it, that's number one, but even more, practice using it to evaluate how you see the world. Practice learning how it helps you figure out what you're supposed to do. If you skip this step, the practice step, if you just learn facts and information about the scripture, but you don't practice using it, don't expect that you're going to approach life any differently. It's not just going to magically start to flow out of you simply because you read it. You have to meditate on it in connection with what's actually taking place in the rest of your life. How do you do that? One of the easiest ways is to just get into a simple habit. When you read something, when you hear something, see something in the larger world, ask yourself, how does God feel about this? How does he think about it? What does he have to say about it? What's important to him about it? Is there anything in scripture that helps me <laughs> to engage it? You have to do that personally, but we have to do that more than just personally. We have to do that in community. Scripture has to be the center of your conversation with your friends, with your family, with your CG, with your ministry team. Don't let yourself engage the issues of the day without it, because if you don't use scripture to think about the world, if you know the Bible without applying it, without seeing how it applies to life, then you're going to end up on the road to King Joash. There's something that I did not share with us about Joash, and that is that when he became king at age seven, he was given a copy of the scriptures a copy written on a scroll that apparently didn't make it from the scroll into his heart, into his mind. Certainly not in the same way that those words made it into Jesus's heart and mind. What's our hope? How can we not go down the road of Joash? It's this, Jesus, the word of God himself is in us. And we're in him. We have a much better chance of having his word live in us like it did in him. It took his death and his resurrection to accomplish that, but he has placed himself and a desire for his words in us. We have an advantage that Joash didn't have. And so let's work then to take full advantage of that opportunity that we now have. I want to offer us an extended time to pray together. It's important for us as leaders. So whether you want to be at your tables or just get into clusters, maybe two or three people together, 
Um, we're going to spend probably 20, 30 minutes in prayer. What would I suggest you pray about? I would suggest maybe two different categories. One would be personally, but the other one, make sure your focus is about us as a church. And so obviously I, I'm, I'm hoping that the Lord will have placed, I'm been praying that the Lord will have placed something from this morning on your heart and mind. Spend time thinking about that personally. Spend time repenting over that. Spend time thanking God for his word. Ask him for a greater desire. But then do that for us as a community. Repent for us as a community. Repent for us for having just wonderfully good times together that don't necessarily revolve around his word as much as they need to. Thank him that he has not abandoned us, not left us without his word. That's an amazing thing that we have scripture. And then ask him for a greater desire among us as a community. Let's take about 20 minutes to pray together, uh, and then we'll move into the next part of this morning. Uh, if you guys want to meet in the foyer here, anywhere, it's all available for us. So as long as we're back by 11.15.